Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with Gazpacho. And I know, I waited kind of late in the summer, but the tomatoes around here just weren't that great. But I got some really sweet ones and I decided to make it, and here is my technique. The first thing we need to do is something called concasse tomatoes, which means peel and chop. So I'm going to do this as actually an extra separate demo. But long story short, you put an X in the bottom, you cut the core out of the top. That is controversial. Some people do that after. And then you just throw them in boiling water for about 30 seconds. And what happens is that hot water makes that skin peel off really easy. And as soon as they're cool enough to handle, the skin should come right off. Then you cut them in half, you pull out the seeds, and you chop. And that's concasse tomatoes. And by the way, let me be Captain Obvious here. This gazpacho is only as good as these tomatoes. So you got to use sweet, vine-ripened, real tomatoes. Not those pink supermarket abominations, crime against nature's. Those won't work. Those will be lousy. Okay, so I concasseed about a pound and a half of tomatoes. Next up, I'm going to take half an English cucumber. Now, you don't have to peel English cucumber. The skin is not really bitter like conventional cucumbers are, but the texture is a little tougher. So I took off about half the peel. I'm going to cut that in thin slices, cut that in like little sticks, and then, oh yeah, we're going to dice it small. Now, gazpacho can be really super chunky or really super fine. I'm more of a fine gazpacho person, so I cut mine pretty small. I'm going to toss that in with my tomatoes, and I'm going to add some peppers. I'm going to use red bell pepper, very sweet, very delicious, and some jalapeno. Give it a little bit of heat, a little bit of bitterness. Some onion of some sort is traditional. A lot of people use red onion. I like a little green onion, just the light parts. And some fresh garlic. I'm going to give that a mix. And then we're going to add salt, cumin, a little bit of dry oregano, just a pinch, and some black pepper. We're going to give that a mix. That salt is going to start drawing liquid out of the tomatoes. All right, it's going to create some juice. So set that aside. Then we're going to go to a separate tomato step. I'm going to take some sweet 100 tomatoes. Those are those small, sweet cherry tomatoes you see in the store. Some lime juice. Some Worcestershire sauce. Some balsamic vinegar. And a big splash of olive oil. I'm going to take that over and blend this really smooth and then strain that in to my chopped tomato mixture. So I think you get a really nice combination. Those cherry tomatoes really are the sweetest tomato you can buy. And it really works perfectly to give this like the soupy base. And that strainer is going to catch the little seeds and skin particles. We don't really need that in there. All right, I'm going to give that a stir, and that is just a magnificent color. And you can see, still quite chunky. Last step, an optional step. I like to puree some of this mixture and put it back in. Because I want to puree a little bit of that pepper and cucumber and tomato and get that back into this. So generally, I take about half of the mixture and puree it. Again, I like a pretty smooth gazpacho. If you want it chunkier, don't even do that step. And by the way, you don't have to strain that step. Now, I'm not going to taste this yet. I'm going to give it a stir. I'm going to refrigerate this for at least two hours. It's got to be ice cold. Then I'm going to taste for salt and pepper and adjust the seasoning. Yes, you cayenne freaks. I will add a little bit of cayenne, probably. All right, so I want you to wrap this up. Then taste it before you serve it. It will need more salt. How much? How do I know? All right, you figure it out. But it will need some. All right, so it's chilled. It's been seasoned to perfection, as they like to say. I'm going to serve it up in cold bowls. I'm going to finish with some chiffonade of basil, which gives it a beautiful, beautiful, herby final touch. You can also use cilantro. Very common, probably even more so. But I have a beautiful basil plant in my backyard. So I went with basil. And by the way, some versions use bread in this, like fresh bread to be mixed in with this. I am not a big fan. I don't like wet bread, so I don't put bread in mine. And that's it. It's like a salad on a spoon. It's so delicious. You gotta try this. Only if you can find some awesome tomatoes though. Like I said, the supermarket tomatoes aren't gonna work. But go to the farmer's market, get some end of summer sweet, sweet tomatoes, and give this a try. All the ingredients are on foodwishes.com, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Gazpacho Verde with burrata cheese. That's right, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I think this is probably the most delicious thing I've made so far this year. 
especially when you consider how fast and easy this was. And the bad news? Well, once again, I'm gonna have to make you drive across town to the fancy grocery store so that you can purchase the awesomeness that is burrata cheese. But if you can't or don't wanna do that, or maybe you're lactose intolerant, keep watching anyway. Because even Sans Cheese this Gaspacho Verde was incredible. And one of the coolest things about this recipe, pun intended, is just how few ingredients it takes to put it together. This really is little more than some cucumber herbs and a little bit of garlic. And speaking of cucumber, we have to make sure we get the right one. All right, what we need to use here is something called an English cucumber. And the difference between this and regular cucumber is that the skin is much thinner, very mild, and completely edible. So what we'll do is we'll slice up our cucumber skin and all and toss that into a blender, to which we'll add a couple cloves of sliced garlic, followed by our fresh herbs, and we're gonna use two kinds. We will do a little bit of fresh oregano, plus a nice big handful of sweet basil, and then besides the herbs, we also need some seasoning. So we will toss in a little bit of kosher salt, as well as some cayenne pepper. A little bit of that's always nice. And then we'll finish up with a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And that's gonna be it for our solids, but we also have to add some liquids. And there's gonna be three of them. So we're gonna need a little bit of oil. Extra virgin is fine, but I would not go with one too strongly flavored. And then besides the oil, we're also gonna need some vinegar. And for me, the perfect choice is seasoned rice vinegar which is quite easy to find, but if you can, I'm gonna give you some tips on the blog of what to do. And then last but not least, I'm gonna finish up with some fresh cold water, which I guess is optional depending on your desired thickness, but I'm adding some because as you'll see, I want this kind of thin. And then once we have all that set, we can go ahead and blend this until it's completely liquefied. So I'm gonna go ahead and blend that on the highest speed for about a minute or two, until like I said, it completely liquefies and also turns into one of the most beautiful green colors you've ever seen. Look how pretty that is. I mean, you can't buy that color at the paint store. That, my friends, only appears in nature. And then once that mixture is blended, we're gonna go ahead and strain it, or at least I am. Because what I'm going for here is a very light, very brothy texture. All right, you can certainly use this unstrained in its thicker form, but for me, that does not work as well with the burrata garnish, as I'll explain later. So I'm gonna go ahead and strain this, pressing everything through with a spoon or a spatula, and I'm gonna keep doing that until all the goodness is passed through, and I'm left with just about a quarter cup or a third of a cup of the most fibrous, toughest bits which again, you could totally leave in, nothing wrong with it. This is just all about the texture you want. And once our mixture has been strained, it should look something like this. If I mention how beautiful that color is, I'm sure I have, but that really is stunning. And at this point, because we've been properly trained, we know we have to taste for seasoning. So let me give this a little taste for salt. And it was perfectly seasoned and unbelievably delicious. This just has the most beautiful, freshest, vibrant flavor you'd ever want to taste. And again, we accomplish this with just a couple ingredients. It really is amazing. And you're probably thinking, that sounds great, let's eat. We can't. We have to chill this until it's completely ice cold to get the full effect. So what we'll do is we'll wrap that up and pop it in the fridge for an hour or two to get it properly chilled. I mean, I don't want to be too harsh, but only a psychopath would eat a room temperature gazpacho. It's just not done. So we will chill that thoroughly before service. And then besides making sure our gazpacho verde is muy frío, as I said, you're also gonna to need to find some of this burrata cheese. Oh man, is this stuff good. And if you're not familiar, what this is is basically a really creamy mozzarella cheese that's been stuffed with an even creamier mozzarella cheese, which you have to admit is pretty gangster. And since this stuff is way too soft to cut, what I usually do is just transfer it into some kind of bowl and we'll actually use a spoon to serve it up, which assuming our gazpacho is ice cold by now, we can go ahead and start doing. So we will ladle some of our gazpacho verde into a chilled bowl and then we'll sprinkle down just a little bit of fresh chive. And then go ahead and grab a generous spoonful of that beautiful burrata cheese. And as we do this, you're going to get a great look at that super sexy interior. Some things you can just tell how amazing they're going to taste by looking at them. This is one of those things. So I took a scoop of that and placed it right down in the middle. Which looks amazing except I covered up all my chives. So I decided to scatter a few more on. And then what we'll do to finish this is we'll sprinkle over just a little bit of coarse sea salt which is not only gonna season the cheese, it's also gonna look amazing and provide a little bit of textural interest, since some of those crystals are actually large enough to crunch into as you eat this. And then we'll finish this up with a few drops of extra virgin olive oil, plus the absolutely mandatory piece of toasted bread. And that's it, our gazpacho verde with burrata cheese is done. And I was not kidding in the intro. I really believe this is the most delicious thing I've made and eaten so far this year. Just such an interesting and enjoyable combination of taste and textures. I mean, we have that play between that thick, gooey, rich, decadent cheese, which is perfectly balanced by that thin, ice-cold, bracing, vibrant, fresh-tasting soup. It is just an absolutely fantastic combo. 
And as I mentioned, the toasted bread is mandatory. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do this. And you really want to be able to do that, okay? And by the way, in case you're wondering about the proportions here, I really am serving this more to feature the burrata and actually using that gazpacho verde more like a sauce. But of course, you could take the complete opposite approach and serve up a nice big bowl of this soup with just a few little dollops of the cheese as a garnish. Totally up to you. After all, you are the Jane or John Doe of your gazpacho. But having said that, I realize that not everyone can eat cheese or will find this cheese. So as I've already mentioned, the soup really does work well on its own. In fact, you throw this stuff in a thermos and you bring it to that picnic where it's gonna be like 120 degrees in the shade. If you do that, you'll be enjoying shots of one of the best cold soups of all time. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Golden Steak Gazpacho. That's right, I am very excited to be showing you this extra sunny version of everybody's favorite cold summer soup. And not only is this extremely delicious and incredibly gorgeous, it's also super easy to make as long as you have a blender. And if you don't have a blender, even better, since you'll call a friend that does have a blender, which will create a situation known as a party waiting to happen. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by reviewing our ingredients. Beginning with the star of the show, some sun gold cherry tomatoes, which are just bursting with sweetness and vine ripened tomato flavor, and along with a few regular cherry tomatoes, are gonna produce this soup's amazing color. And then we're also gonna need a little bit of onion and a clove of garlic, as well as an orange bell pepper, which we will only use half of, which brings us to our secret ingredient, a couple ripe peaches, which we'll peel before cutting up. And then last but not least, some English cucumber, which we will also peel, but not because of anything having to do with the flavor. We just don't want that dark green skin screwing up our color. And in case you're wondering, we do not have to remove the seeds for these. But anyway, I'll go ahead and peel the rest of that and the peaches off camera, since nobody logs onto YouTube to watch peeling. Then once we have everything prepped, we'll toss it in a blender. And go slow with the tomatoes, otherwise you're gonna be chasing those all over the kitchen. And then what we'll do once all our fruits and vegetables are in is go ahead and season this up with a generous amount of kosher salt, a little bit of ground cumin, and then three or four or five shakes of cayenne. And then we can finish this up with our liquid ingredients, which will include a couple tablespoons of white wine vinegar, or champagne vinegar, or sherry vinegar, or even rice vinegar. We will also squeeze in the juice of one lime, followed by a little bit of olive oil. And then last but not least, about one cup of cold fresh water. Unless you want yours thicker, in which case leave that out. Or conversely, if you want it thinner, go ahead and add more. But either way, once that's set, we'll go ahead and blend this smooth. Starting off kind of slow, pulsing it on and off, so as not to splash it everywhere. And then, as usual, we'll go ahead and finish up on high speed. And then once that has been successfully processed, I highly recommend we strain this. Right, Sun Gold Cherry Tomatoes are famous for their intense, vibrant, beautiful, sweet flavor. But they also have very, very tough skins. So we'll go ahead and pass this through a mesh strainer, which, as you can see, is going to trap most of that, along with the seeds. And then, if we want, we can go ahead and grab a spoon and give this a taste. But we don't necessarily want to judge it yet or adjust the seasoning. Since at this point, everything is at room temperature, and we're going to serve this ice cold. And it's a proven scientific fact that room temperature things do not taste the same as ice cold things. So what we'll do is wrap this up and pop it in the fridge for at least three or four hours, or until very, very, very cold. Okay, one of the only ways to screw up a gazpacho is to serve it not super cold. But once it is muy frío, we can go ahead and unwrap it, and then give it a thorough stirring, since you're probably going to have some clear stuff on the bottom and some foamy stuff on the top. But after a brief agitation, you'll see everything will come together beautifully. And you'll be looking at one of the most beautiful cold soups of all time. And now that it's ice cold, we can finally grab a spoon and give it the official taste. And then adjust if need be. And it's almost always going to need some more salt, which mine did. As well as a couple shakes of cayenne, which it didn't need, but I added anyway. And that's it. Once we're happy with this, we can go ahead and serve it up. And garnish it any which way we want which for me is gonna be with some finely crumbled feta, as well as a little bit of diced fresh peach, and then finally a little touch of finely and freshly sliced basil. And while I think these toppings pair perfectly with this, there are so many other things you could use. I mean, you are after all the Hector Camacho of this surprisingly macho gazpacho, 
so feel free to adapt this to your taste. But personally, I think the feta, peach, and basil really are a knockout with this, especially if we finish this off with a little kiss of cayenne. And that's it. Let me go ahead and grab a spoon. And that, my friends, is one of the most delicious, most interesting, most refreshing, and visually stunning gazpachos you will ever have. And make no mistake, despite the addition of the peaches, this really is 100% savory. In fact, if you forced your guests to eat this blindfolded, which we don't recommend, but if you did, they would swear they were eating a regular gazpacho, and a very exceptional one at that. And by the way, if the thought of adding peaches to stuff like cucumbers and peppers and tomatoes seems weird, well, it really shouldn't, since tomatoes are actually a fruit also. As everybody who's ever been stuck next to that guy at a cocktail party has already heard, you know, the same guy that gets upset when you say preheat the oven instead of heat the oven? Yeah, that guy. But anyway, the point is that subtle sweetness from the peach is what I think makes this soup so extra special. I mean, really, I shouldn't be this excited over a cold soup, and yet I am. So please go out and find some sun gold tomatoes, and a couple ripe peaches, and of course a blender, and then give this amazingly beautiful and uniquely delicious gazpacho a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. White gazpacho. That's right, gazpacho made without tomatoes. And I know it's not exactly white, it's kind of light green. But you know what? Light green gazpacho doesn't sound as cool. Regardless, it is super delicious and the perfect summer first course. So here we go. The only thing you have to do ahead of time is cook some leeks. So I'm gonna put about a cup of chopped leeks into a saucepan with a little bit of vegetable oil on medium heat, maybe even medium low with a pinch of salt. And we're gonna cook those for about 10, 15 minutes until soft. Do not brown them, you just want them to soften. Now one reason my white gazpacho is a little light green is because I did use some of the green parts and you're really supposed to only use the white, but I don't mind the color and I like the flavor, so I used a little bit of the green. All right, once those are done, just put them on a plate and let them cool completely. This needs to be totally cool before it's added to the other ingredients. All right, so that's done. We're gonna set that aside and it's on to the rest of the ingredients. First of which is a couple English cucumbers which I'm certainly gonna peel again. We want this to be as light as white as possible. All right, once those are peeled, just chop them up. This is all going in the blender. No need to seed them. So we're gonna throw those in the blender. And then we're gonna add some green seedless grapes. And those are gonna add a nice, subtle sweetness that really kind of makes this. All right, so a handful of green grapes. I'm also gonna throw in some blanched almonds. I want those little slivered kinds. I don't want any of those dark specks from the almond skin messing up the unbearable lightness of my soup. All right, we're also gonna add some olive oil, a big pinch of salt, we'll adjust that later. And then for a little creamy tanginess, some creme fraiche. You can use yogurt, you can use sour cream. So I'm gonna throw that in. And then just like a traditional gazpacho, we want some bread. No crust, just crumble the inside of an Italian or French loaf of bread. I have about a cup. And this is not a thick soup, but that will give it a little bit of body. So we're gonna to toss that in. And then another traditional gazpacho ingredient, a little sherry vinegar. I'm sure you could use just about any vinegar you want. You can also use lemon juice, but you do need some acidity to balance the flavors. And at that point, we can add our cooled leeks. And last but not least, a little bit of cold water. Better to start out with not enough. You can always add a little more, but this is not really something you can reduce. And after we add the water, we're gonna go over to the blender and we're gonna process this until completely, completely smooth. So I let that blend for about a minute. And then because we want this to have a very extra fine, smooth texture, we are gonna pass it through a fine mesh strainer that's gonna get out any chunks, whether it's pieces of almond or grape skins or cucumber seeds or whatever. So you wanna pass that through. And you can see there, after you strain it, you're gonna have the most beautiful, luxurious texture and pretty awesome looking. Like I said, not white, but very light. Good enough for me. All right, we're gonna wrap that and refrigerate it completely before we season it. Because you're gonna serve this ice cold, you don't wanna season it until it's ice cold. All right, so we're gonna wrap that up and we're gonna refrigerate this. So a couple hours in the fridge, I pull it back out, then we're gonna taste, then we're gonna adjust. It's probably gonna need more salt, mine certainly did. If you undersalt this, it's not gonna be any good. All right, I'm gonna put a little touch of spice with some cayenne, you could also use white pepper. And then you see me adjusting there with a little more vinegar, a few more drops, I thought it just needed a little extra bit of sharpness. And to save time, let me answer that question right now. Can you put other stuff in here instead of the stuff I put in? No, no you can't. 
All right, one final tasting, and I've decided it's perfect. So at this point, you're fine to serve it as long as it's ice cold, although one optional step I love is freezing a little bit of it is ice cubes. Again, I can't stress enough, this is unbelievably delicious as long as it's super, super, super cold. So what I'll do is I'll freeze some ice cubes, I'll put that in the cup, I'll top it with the already ice cold chilled soup, and then you're not gonna have to worry about if it's cold enough. It will be cold enough. And then for final garnishing, I'm gonna add some thinly sliced grapes, so pretty. I had some sliced almonds around, and I know I didn't use these inside, but don't get all technical on me. It still makes a beautiful garnish. And then one last touch, I'm gonna put a few drops of dill oil on top, because that will taste good and look awesome. And how did I make that? It's so easy. I'll explain on the blog post. And then maybe just a little touch of fresh dill just to warn people what the oil is. And that is done. White gazpacho. If you hablo de espanol, you could call it gazpacho blanco. And you know, I'm no big fan of pretty food, but this really does look beautiful and tastes just as lovely. Just super light, refreshing, definitely savory, but has that little bit of sweetness from the grapes. Just a beautiful, beautiful hot weather first course. And again, the keys, you must season it carefully and serve it as ice, ice, ice cold as possible. And if you do that, you're in for a huge treat. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chilled sugar snap pea soup. That's right, we're doing this classic cold spring soup, and instead of using English peas, we're gonna use sugar snap, which is gonna save you a lot of shelling time. And I know you could have avoided the shelling by using frozen peas, but for now, let's just pretend you're not like that. But in any case, this is an incredibly easy soup to make, beautiful to look at, and most importantly of all, incredibly delicious. So here we go. We're gonna start by prepping some leeks. You can of course just use regular onions for this, but like peas, leeks are a very traditional spring ingredient. So I'm gonna chop up a couple leeks, we're gonna cut them in half lengthwise and then just slice them up like that. Of course, you're gonna wash these very thoroughly. We don't want sandy soup. So next up, we're gonna go over to the stove where I have a pot on medium heat to which I'm gonna add some olive oil. We're gonna to toss in our leeks along with a big pinch of salt. And we're gonna sweat those on medium for about five or six minutes until they start getting soft. And by the way, the reason we're using olive oil is because this is a cold soup. We don't necessarily want butter because when butter gets cold, it gets hard and you'll actually get like a thin film of butter fat on your tongue if you use it in a chilled soup. So generally better to go with olive oil. So I cook that stirring occasionally for about five or six minutes until it looked like that. Next, we're gonna add some stock or broth. I'm using chicken, I like chicken, but you could certainly use vegetable stock or even water here, no problem. And we're gonna raise the heat up to high because we need to bring this up to a boil before we add our sugar snap peas. All right, so crank that up to high and while we're waiting for it to boil, we're gonna go ahead and season it up with a little bit of black pepper, a little bit of cayenne. The final seasoning will be done when the soup is cold, but we know it's gonna need a little bit. And then we probably got five or six minutes before this comes to a boil and that would be the perfect amount of time to prep your sugar snaps. So there they are, I got one pound of sugar snap peas, it's a cross between a snow pea and a regular English pea, and you can eat the whole thing, except I do like to pull off this string. So I'm just pinching the tip and pulling that string off the flat side. It comes right off, very simple. And by the way, this may be totally unnecessary since we're gonna strain this, but you know what? Old prep cook habits die hard, and I figured better safe than stringy. And by the time your peas are prepped, your liquid should be boiling, and at that point, you're gonna go ahead and dump those in. Again, the heat's on as high as it will go. I'm gonna give those a stir. I'm also gonna add a couple mint leaves and that's gonna come back to the boil. And then we're just gonna cook that until these are just almost barely tender. I'm gonna guess and say five or six minutes, but you're gonna check. Give it about four or five minutes, then go ahead and stick your tongs in, pull one out, take a bite. And it should be what they call tender crisp, meaning you can bite into it quite easily, but it still has a little bit of firmness to it. And yes, I'm allowed to put that half back in because it's just me and my wife eating. That's one of the main reasons I got married so I could do things like that. That and of course her family's fortune, and then once you deem them adequately cooked, we're gonna turn off the heat, we're gonna take a strainer, and we're gonna fish those out into a bowl. We're gonna leave the liquid in the pot, don't discard it. But I just want the peas for now. And we're gonna bring those over to the blender so we can puree them. And why didn't I scoop them directly into the blender? That is a great question. So we're gonna transfer the peas into a blender, and then we're gonna pour in half the liquid. All right, blending hot soup is very dangerous. It can totally splash up and fly out of the blender. And that's much less likely to happen if you only start with half the liquid. 
Also, to hedge our bets, let's put a towel over the top. That's mandatory. And then start slow, pulse on and off a couple times on a lower speed. And then you can turn it up a little bit. And then once that initial pureeing happens, go ahead and dump in the rest of the stock and then put it on whatever the highest liquefying speed you have and let that blend super, super smooth. And that's pretty much it. We're gonna pour that into a strainer. Now again, be very careful, extremely hot. And we're gonna use a spatula to push everything through and everything's gonna pass through except for the toughest, largest fibers. So that's pretty good, we got most of it. And you can see here just a beautiful color, a beautiful, luxurious texture. Now at this point, I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to taste it. I don't want you to try to season it. I want you to let this cool down to room temperature. I want you to cover it. And then I want you to refrigerate it until it is ice, ice cold. You have to season things at the temperature they're gonna be served. So wrap it up, put it in the refrigerator for a few hours until it's ice, ice cold. And then we're gonna unwrap and season. And I'm gonna guess you're gonna need a decent amount of salt, maybe another shake of cayenne. If it's under seasoned, it will be, what's the word I'm looking for? Insipid? Is that too strong? It won't be good. It'll be bland and boring. But with enough salt and a little bit of pepper, it is going to be spectacular. And then once you're happy with the seasoning, we're going to go ahead and ladle that into a bowl. And then we're going to get a little fancy. You definitely want to garnish this with some creme fraiche or sour cream. But we're not just going to plop in a dollop like some peasants. We're going to use a squeeze bottle and make a little swirl. And we're going to take a bamboo skewer. And we're going to go like this and like that and like this and a until we have this beautiful design. Oh, believe me, those restaurant chefs aren't happy right now. I showed you that. That's like one of their things they only think they should be able to do. And once our fermented cream surface graphics are done, we're gonna finish with a little bit of fresh mint. And that is done. Chilled sugar snap pea soup. And it tastes exactly like it looks. Light, refreshing, delicious. And that creme fraiche and mint really, really elevates this. Just the perfect accents. That little bit of acidity from the creme fraiche, very important. In fact, if you're not gonna use creme fraiche or sour cream, I highly suggest you squeeze a little bit of lemon in this for the same effect. But anyway, there you go. A chilled vegetable soup using spring's second most popular vegetable after asparagus, which really isn't the peas fault. Asparagus has a much more marketable shape, but the peas don't care, so why should we? All right, so I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bye.